Good morning. Um, I am extremely pleased to have Professor Jamie Pennebaker joining us today for the MIDA Symposium. I have known Jamie for many years, and many of those years are known to him. I have been following his research, and I was very excited about the kind of work that he was doing. About five years ago, I eventually invited him to give a talk, and around the same time, we also started to collaborate. I have to say, this has been one of the most rewarding collaborations I have ever had, and I am working in computer science, while Professor Jamie Pennebaker is working in psychology. This is one of the things that I very much admire, uh, admire about Jamie, the fact that he's able to go across disciplines so seamlessly with his research. I could tell you many things about him. Um, just going over his CV, I could tell you about the hundreds of articles that he wrote. I could tell you about the many books that he published. I could tell you about the numerous awards that he has received, um, or the fact that he is one of the most widely cited scholars in social sciences. Uh, but instead of that, uh, I want to give you two highlights, which are a couple of the things that, of the many things that I, I see in Jamie. Um, one of them, and he's most likely going to tell you more about that, is a lexicon, a resource that he put together several years ago, uh, which aims to help build a tool that would contribute to better understanding people. Uh, that's a resource that he created with students and collaborators in, in his own discipline of psychology. Uh, but what happened is that that lexicon, that resource, is now one of the most widely used resources in computer science uh, within the area of natural language processing. And to me, that really speaks volumes about the impact of, of Jamie's work. Um, research that he's been doing is going well beyond his discipline and is making a difference in, in many other areas. And I also want to share with you an anecdote. Um, about a couple of years ago, as I was driving to work, I noticed in the parking lot a yellow Mustang. Um, and I did notice it because you don't really see too many yellow cars out there. Um, and even less so, you don't see that many yellow Mustangs. Um, next day, when I drove to work, again, I see the yellow Mustang. And now, somehow, surprisingly, I see in the same spot. I say maybe it's coincidence, um, so I go on. Uh, but on the third day when I come, the same yellow Mustang, the same spot. And that eventually went on for about six months, where I see the same car in the same spot, most likely around the same time, because regardless of when I drive to work, I still see this, this car in that same spot. So after all this time, I eventually figure, well, I'm going to ask Jamie what does he think about that. I mean, he, he works in psychology. So I, I wrote him an email and said, what do you think? And I tell him about this yellow Mustang, which somehow discrepantly, it's, it's pointing to an adventurous person, but he is just parking the same spot at the same time, which maybe it's less adventurous. Um, he did not ask me questions. So he did not try to give me a survey and say, well, what time of hour, what, what time of day would, would you see him? Or how old is the car? Or have you tried to pick inside? Just from that information that I gave him, that that story about that yellow Mustang, he just wrote back and said, well, this is a middle-aged man who works in administration, and most likely he is doing repetitive tasks. So I said, OK, well, maybe, how, what do I know? I mean, he might be right or not. Um, and I kept noticing the car for a little longer until eventually one day, mystery solved. I, I ran into the driver of the, of the yellow Mustang, and guess what? It is a middle-aged man who works in administration and is doing repetitive tasks. And to me, it's really an anecdote, but to me, this really speaks about the mag magic that the Jamie and, and his systems is able to do. You get some language, a story, and he somehow magically turns that into, into insights about people. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with Professor Jamie Pennebaker. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more. I'm pretty sure Daniela would uh, 
back me up statistically on my estimation of the driver of the uh, yellow Mazda. Today what I'd like to do is to have a discussion about kind of the way, uh, the nature of words. And I come to this from a kind of an oddball perspective. Uh, the fact that I'm speaking to a data science group would have shocked my uh, uh, graduate advisor. Uh, because I was trained as a social psychologist, and a, and a traditional social psychologist basically does uh, laboratory studies with small samples and grand theories, and using very, very simple statistics, and, rely, and historically relies on questionnaires or self-reports, asking people, well, this happened, how do you feel now? I ended up starting to take a very different approach to the world, and I should say that I have absolutely no training in language. I have no, uh, I have finally learned parts of speech, but that took me, I was in my 50s before I really started to appreciate that. Today what I'd like to do is to give you kind of what I view as um, an interesting way to start thinking about words and language, and also to make a, a, a plea, which I'm really excited about in terms of this group, and that is to appreciate that the world of social science is, is tr being transformed radically and wonderfully by collaborations with uh, fields such as computer science. And this has been what I've been most excited about over the last several years. And today what I could do is just give you a, a background and, and a story about how I have discovered how words are really critically important. I'm going to focus on three things. The first is how words can tell us about the individual, the individual's personality, the way that they think, et cetera. And secondly, how we can analyze words to get a better sense of human relationships, so how two or more people are interacting with one another. And finally, how we can use these same words to analyze the text itself and get a, a, a different kind of nuanced view of it. Now, I'll begin with a, a little bit of background. My early work focused on the nature of stress, and I was, always, I was interested in how we could get a sense of people's psychological state to predict illness. And uh, what I discovered, and what we had known for a long time, was that when people have any kind of major trauma in their lives, any kind of major upheaval, they're much more likely to get sick. They're more likely to be hospitalized. They're more likely to have all sorts of both major and minor health problems. Through a long uh, a series of uh, peculiar discoveries, I found that individuals who had had a major traumatic experience but had kept that, ex that experience secret, placed them at even greater risk for illness and hospitalization. So the first work I discovered was that people who had had a traumatic sexual experience tended not to talk with other people about it, and if they had not talked about it, they were much more likely to have health problems than if they had talked about it. But it turned out in later studies, and these were basically surveys, any kind of upheaval a person has that they keep secret was associated with health problems. And this made me start to wonder, what if we brought people in the laboratory and had them disclose these secrets that they hadn't told others? Would their health improve? And so I did a study, a, kind of a speculative study in the, in the 80s, where we brought college students in the laboratory and we r randomly assigned them to one of two conditions. Now we didn't have them talk to somebody, rather we had them write. And for half the people, we asked them to write about the most traumatic, upsetting experience of their lives, ideally one that they had not talked to other people about. And we had them write for about 15 minutes a day for four days in the laboratory. And the other half, were, who were randomly put into the control condition, were asked to write about superficial topics, uh, how they used their time, their plans for the day, things like that. And they also were in the laboratory for four days, writing for 15 minutes each day. Now this manipulation turned out to be remarkably powerful. Students who were writing about traumas wrote about horrible experiences, something that in everybody in this room, about half of the essays were, were traumas that everybody here would agree were major upheavals. We also got permission from the students to get their, their student health center visits in the months before versus after being in the experiment. And what we found was that those people who were assigned to write about traumatic experiences ended up going to the student health center at about half the rate 
as people in the control condition over the next three or four months. In other words, this relatively simple manipulation had this profound effect on the students. And it, was, it had a profound effect in ways that I had never seen before as well. So for example, in the months after that study, I had this, I had this odd experience of walking on campus and a student would come up to me and say, Dr. Pennebaker, I just want to thank you for, for your letting me be in, in your study. As a social scientist, that had never happened before in my life. That, that these people were grateful to be in the study to have the opportunity to write about upsetting experiences. After that first study, we did a second study, and this one I collaborated with a group at Ohio State, Jan Kiko Glazer and Ron Glazer. They were doing some early work in, in the field of psychoneuroimmunology. In this study, we, we again randomly assigned people to write about traumas or superficial topics, but before they were assigned a condition, we drew blood and then drew blood again after the four days of writing and then, then again six weeks later. And the blood was sent up to Columbus where it was assayed for various immune markers. And what we found was that those who were assigned to, to the experimental condition had enhanced immune markers as a function of, of uh, the writing manipulation. And by this time, this, we had published those two studies. Other labs around the country and later around the world started to do expressive writing studies. And today, now, 30 years later, there have probably been well over 1,000 studies uh, published on expressive writing. And generally, the, the early patterns hold. The effect sizes are, are quite modest. But nevertheless, writing about upsetting experiences has an effect on people's health. It also affects their sleep. It affects all sorts of, of, of other things. But the question I started to become more interested in was, why in the world does writing about something like a trauma make such a difference with people? And uh, many labs, uh, again, around the world, started doing study after study trying to identify what was the magic bullet, what, what, what mediated this effect. And as frequently happens with social science, and actually science in general, it was a dirty, messy kind of answer. And it seems now, as we look back 30 years, it seems as though there's a whole sequence of, it, of events that occur, none of which is absolutely required. We know from various studies that merely labeling an upsetting experience seems to be really important. Secondly, writing about it helps, to, helps the person by organizing the effect, or the event. Another issue is that uh, people tend to sleep better after writing. And we know that sleep is associated with immune functions, it's associated with all sorts of things. It's also associated with uh, in, in improvements in working memory, the ability just to uh, remember things in the short run. We, it's also associated with increased social activity as measured by devices where we had people wear uh, uh, tape recorders that essentially come on for about 30 seconds and go off for 12 minutes. We have people wear these for two, two days prior to writing and then uh, uh, a month later. And we find that those people in the experimental group tend to spend more time talking with others, they're more socially enmeshed. But what I was particularly interested in was, how, can we look at people's writing and identify who benefits versus who does not benefit? And this was an important question because in this expressive writing paradigm, what I had discovered was that not everybody benefits. Maybe half of the people show a, a true health benefit. And the health markers, I should point out, are quite dirty themselves. So I began by having people, uh, judges, clinical psychology students, to read these various essays and to, ev to, to evaluate to what degree did the person seem to uh, express emotion? To what degree did people seem to find some kind of meaning in what they were writing? Was this a good story, a compelling story, et cetera, et cetera? And what I discovered was that when you get people to read a series of really horrifying, depressing essays, that the people who are doing the judging for you get depressed. And, and even worse, they don't even agree on most of the dimensions. So here's a technique that was unreliable and you know, essentially traumatized the people who are doing the reading. This was, this was not an efficient use of people's time. So it occurred to me, I need a computer program that can go through and analyze these essays. And, this was in the early 90s, and uh, I started searching around for one, and I couldn't find one that, the kind that I wanted. 
And so working with one of my graduate students, we t together built this computer program. The computer program is called Linguistic Inquiry, Inquiry and Word Count, L-I-W-C, which is pronounced Luke. And I know it doesn't sound like it should be pronounced Luke, but it's my program, and I'm calling it Luke. So the Luke program, by a computer scientist's perspective, especially in the early days, is the stupidest, most embarrassing program in the world. It's just a dumb word count program. But what made it nice is that I, I went in and tried to make these various d dictionaries uh, to be really trustworthy. So for example, we had various emotion dictionaries, and then we had various cognitive dictionaries and others, and we would get groups of judges to, first of all, let's say we had an anger dictionary, and we started off in terms of find, trying to figure out what words would be anger-related words. So we started off with, with a dictionary, then with thesauruses, and then <coughs> questionnaires that had measured anger, and then we would have people generate anger words, and we'd come up with these long lists, and then we'd have judges go for each, look at each word and make a decision, is this word associated with anger? And they would go through each one and the judges had to agree and this went through various processes. So initially we ended up with this computer program and that allowed us to go in and go into any given text and calculate the percentage of total words that were anger related words or more esoteric things like uh, causal words. Uh, we know in psychology that the degree to which a person makes, uh, thinks in terms of causal ways, using words like because, cause, effect, is sometimes related to psychological state. And, uh, but then we had more cognitive words, we had all these other kind of words, and we, because they were easy, we got various parts of, parts of speech, articles, A, N, and D, uh, personal pronouns, first person singular, I, me, and my, etc. So we went back to, by this time there had been a number ex of expressive writing studies that we and other labs have done, and I got seven of the studies, and we went through to analyze these studies to see if we could find any predictive, any fact, any language that predicted long-term uh, health changes. In those studies and later, we came up with about three or four dimensions that uh, typically popped up. So the first was the use of positive emotion words. The more that people could use positive emotion words while writing about traumas, the more likely they were to benefit. So these would be words like care, love, happy. And even if a person says, uh, no one cares about me, I'm not happy, nobody loves me, that person was actually better off than someone who said that they were sad, that people hate me, etc. In other words, thinking along the dimension of happiness, even if you're not happy, if you're not happy, you're a lot better off than being sad. Because not happy, the person is psychologically thinking along this happiness dimension. The second thing that, that we found was that people who seem to be constructing stories over the course of writing seem to benefit. So we looked at various cognitive words, so causal words, etc. People who started off on the first day of writing not using many of these cognitive words and then increased in their use of cognitive words over the days of writing, they were much more likely to benefit than were people who used cognitive words at the same rate over the, over the, the, the period of writing. In other words, having a story is not beneficial. Constructing a story was. And then we did some other analytic methods over the years, and we found that the ability for the person to change perspectives was really important. So we, were, uh, we, uh, we, used, a, uh, we used other methods looking at, discovered that pronouns were particularly important, that individuals who bounced between use of first person singular pronouns, I, me, and my, and other pronouns, which would include we, us, you, he, she, they. The person who bounced on one day being high in first person, the next day being high in other pronouns, and back, going back and forth, in which way they went back and forth wasn't important, turned out to be a really powerful predictor, and it's a marker of people changing perspectives from one day to the next. Now, all of this started to intrigue me. Now, the Luke program was developed just at the time the internet was coming online. And so I would start, I started, because I could start analyzing everything, I needed data, data sets. So every night, I'll never forget in the, in the early 90s, 
we had just gotten AOL. Those of us in this room who are above a certain age have fond memories of AOL when it first came out because they had these chat groups. And the chat groups were all different types. There, of course, there were the pickup chat groups, there were the gay chat groups, there were the sports groups, there were the old people's groups, etc. And every night I would go and just start downloading a different group. And I, then I would start just analyzing the data every day, trying to figure out what I could see about groups as a function of their use of words. And I started to discover that the way words worked didn't make much sense to me. Now keep in mind that the Luke program, initially I thought the primary thing was going to be emotions. Because most people, this is kind of the, what sentiment analysis is. And by the way, for those of you who are big sentiment analysis, be very careful. Sentiment analysis is a really very low level, simplistic way of thinking about emotions. Because emotions didn't evolve for language. Because we, we convey emotions in all these nonverbal ways. But you can pick up emotions through a lot of ways outside of emotion words, such as pronouns. In any case, uh, I started looking at the difference between men and women and how they use language. And I was shocked that it, all of this didn't work even remotely the way that I thought language would work. So for example, every time I would do a study, I'd get these big differences in ways that made no sense. So I started looking, first of all, at emotion words. Virtually no difference between men and women. And then I looked at pronouns, especially first person singular pronouns, I, me, and my. I was going on the assumption that obviously men would use I words more because they're more arrogant, narcissistic, self-important, etc. Well, it turns out across all my samples, women always use first person singular pronouns more. Now, I now know that men are still arrogant, self-important, narcissistic compared to women, but men do not use I words more. And it turns out the use of I words is not a marker of arrogance or self-importance. I words, like all pronouns, tell us where people are paying attention in the world. That a person who uses I, by definition, is self-focused. They're looking in on themselves because they are anxious or uh, they are interested in how they're feeling or their attention is drawn to them. Which means, and this is true in, through now dozens of studies, people who are depressed use I words much more than people who are not depressed. People who are physically sick, people who are physically in pain, use I words more. People who are insecure use I words more. In other words, there are all these interesting factors that are associated with self-focus. And if you ask a person to reflect on how they're feeling, by definition, they're going to use I words at a higher rate. I also found big differences in articles, A, N, and me. And I remember thinking, what the hell do articles even mean? Why would, you know, why would any self-respecting psychologist look at articles? Well, by God, there are huge differences between men and women in their use of articles and prepositions, men using them at much higher rates. Why would that be? Well, it turns out it's a question of what men versus women tend to talk about. Women in these AOL chat groups, and almost anything else we study, devote more time to talking about other human beings. It also turns out that women also use uh, uh, third person pronouns at much higher rates. But men don't talk about other human beings at, at the same rates. They talk about objects and things. They talk about cars. They talk about just things. And if you're talking about things, by definition, you use more articles and prepositions. And then there was, I became interested in these cognitive words that I had been studying. These were words like because, cause, effect, reason, rationale, or words like understand, realize, or know. And these are cognitive words. Who uses those words more, men or women? It turns out women use them at much higher rate. And why is that? Because women are talking more about other human beings, and men are talking about objects and things, and other human beings are far more complex than are objects and things. And consequently, in just looking at the text and analyzing them, you see this different level of cognitive activity going on. Now, I wasn't, frankly, interested in the difference between men and women. I was interested more in what this says about a person, because sometimes men use, men use uh, uh, social words at very high rates and sometimes low rates, and the same thing with women. There are variations in pronoun use or articles of preposition. 
Well, I was going through all this early work, and I was on a flight somewhere, and I was reading a book that had just come out by George Miller called The Science of Words. And in it, he makes a distinction that it had never occurred to me. And he made a distinction between what he called uh, content words and function words. Content words are the words that, are, that we use to convey content. They're, they're the guts of an interaction. Content words are nouns, regular verbs, uh, most articles, most uh, adjectives, and some uh, uh, adverbs. See, I do know my parts of speech. Uh, the, these function words were these all the little junk words in between that we all ignore. And they, they're, they're essentially about seven or eight primary categories. There are personal pronouns, I, me, you, he, she. There are uh, impersonal pronouns, it, somebody, thing, words like that. There are um, articles, a, n, and the, prepositions, two, of, four. There are negations, no, not, never, auxiliary verbs, uh, is, was, have, had. Um, certain non-referential adverbs like so, really, very and uh, some conjunctions, and, or, because, etc., and probably one or two other dimensions. Now here's what's interesting. The average person in this room has a vocabulary of almost 100,000 words. 99%, 99.5% of those words are content words. The other half a percent are of these function words. Now in English, only, uh, there are only about 500 words that are uh, function words. Nevertheless, this small group of words account for about 60 to 65 percent of all the words we say, we hear, we read. And this is what's interesting. We have this huge number of function words. They account for most of the, most of the words that go into our ears, but we don't listen to them. We don't hear them. So for example, have I used a more articles than, than average since I've been talking. You have absolutely no idea. I have absolutely no idea. I'm a world expert on article use, and I can't tell if you're using articles at high rates. Partly because we know fr from uh, brain damage research that articles or that uh, function words are processing the brain differently than content words. So there can be damage to one area of, of the brain, and the person w basically can just use content words, but they have real problems with function words. And other parts of brain damage, primarily in the frontal lobe in Broca's area, uh, or that, that's the area if there's damage there, the individual uses primarily content words. There can be damage to Wernicke's area, which is in the temporal lobe, and the person has a functioning Broca's area, frontal lobe, and the person, if you ask them a question, will speak, and they'll be socially skilled, but all they'll do is talk in word salad, and that word salad are function words. So if I have damage to, to the, the uh, temporal lobe and my Broca area is working, and I'm asked to describe what I see up here on the, on the stage, I say, well, that's there, it's right next to that, and you can see over there, this is there, and it's like, oh, look, look there, that, that's a, uh, well, you can see what it is. The point is, is almost all of those words are function words. Now, here's what's interesting. Function words are inherently social. Imagine that you came into the building today, and as you walked in, there's a wet piece of paper on the ground, and there's a, it's a note, and the note says, uh, I'm not here, I'll be right back. Now, on one level, that note makes perfect sense, but another, it makes absolutely no sense because all of those words are function words. I, who wrote it? Am, not here. Am is in present tense. When was it written? Not here. Was this note always here? Etc. And the point is, is those words are only known and understand by the speaker and by the person who was the intended audience. And if we found that author of that note a year from now and say, here's a note that you wrote a year ago, what does this refer to? There's a good chance they would have no idea. Function words exist at, as these placeholders that, it, that have only value right now in this context in relation to a, 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 a somebody else. 
And by analyzing these function words, we can start to get a sense of people's psychological state. And not just an individual person, but entire, uh, say, groups and organizations, and in, in fact, entire parts of the country, entire cultures. So we can even go back and start looking historically how function words have changed. To give you an example of this, I could go in today and analyze everybody's outgoing emails for the last month. I would find that some of you use third person pronouns at very high rates, he, she, they. And some of you would use them at very low rates. By definition, people who use them at high rates are interested in other human beings. And people who don't use them are much less interested in other human beings. It's a marker of attention. It tells me about you. It tells me about the group that you hang around with. And this is kind of the essence of the research I've been doing. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the studies that I've done and other labs have done over the years. And I should also point out, when I say I've done, you should know that that's a complete lie. I means basically I have a, a remarkable group of graduate students who have been working closely with me my entire career. And much of what I'm telling you about is really their work. So first of all, there are big differences in demographics. Age, sex, and social class. We see, we can do a very good job at identifying if the, if the person is a male or female, if they are young versus old, if they're upper middle class versus lower middle class by the analysis of language. And I'm not gonna go into the various dimensions that predict it, but we do a fine job. We've also looked at this in terms of personality. Um, and personality is an interesting issue. One of the topics that I am gonna end up with today is this, the problem that social science has had since its inception. One of the big problems is, uh, Daniela talked about the, how, how complex the data, the data that we get often is. And the social science data is really, it's a really messy world. And one way that the social scientists have dealt with this is to rely on self-reports. Self-reports are glorious because they're generally normally distributed, they make good sense, the items are related to one another, and self-reports do a phenomenal job at predicting other self-reports. The only minor problem is self-reports are not very closely related to real-world behavior. But, but we'll work on that, it's been what I've been told for the last 50 years. The problem is, is that self-reports reflect self-theories. Self-theories self are indeed internally consistent, and they are consistent over time as well. But once you get into the real world and start getting, looking at real data, we know that thing, the world's not normally distributed, and it's, it's much messier. And this is true with language, but now the interesting question is, how can we start predicting things beyond just self-reports? Does language predict self-reports? Yes, some, it's not great. So for example, let's say we're interested in neuroticism. Those of you who have a passing knowledge of social science have probably heard of the Big Five personality measure. And what, what many of my colleagues do, they just say, well, I guess that's personality, we'll just give people the Big Five. The Big Five is it's fine if you're gonna rely on a self-report. One of the dimensions is neuroticism, the degree to which people are anxious, upset, etc. You would expect someone who is highly anxious would use lots of anxiety and negative emotion words in their language, whether it's email, whether they're writing a personal diary, et cetera. Well, the there is a correlation there, a positive correlation, but the positive correlation average is about a 0.18. Now, that's a pretty pathetic relationship for two things that you would think should be highly, highly correlated. And the psychometrics are quite impressive in terms of use of negative emotion words. A person who uses negative emotion words at high rates today, use, use them at high rates tomorrow, and next year, and five years from now. How do self-reports of anxiety versus the use of negative emotion words predict things that you would hope would be related to anxiety? Let's say going to physicians for illness. In other words, let's get real data from the Student Health Center, which, which we do. We find that use of language predicts health center visits better than self-reports of anxiety. In other words, negative emotion words actually, uh, actually predict real-world behavior. Now, the, the correlations are still low, but the point is, is that by getting language markers, we start to predict 
things about people that are often important. Now we look at many things beyond mood. In fact, mood is one of the things I'm least interested in. So for example, we've done a lot of work on predictions of uh, depression and also suicide proneness. We know, for example, in the analysis of the works of suicidal versus non-suicidal poets, there are big differences in their way, the way they use language. There is no difference in the way they use negative emotion words. Turns out all, all poets are depressed. That's part of a, the job description. But, but the suicidal poets use I words at higher rates than non-suicidal poets. Just as we know that people who are depressed use uh, more I words than people who are non-depressed. We're also interested in, uh, in a number of other things. For example, I've done, I've done and many other labs have done works on deception. Can you tell if someone is telling the truth versus lying? Now many of the studies have been done with essentially lab studies where you induce people to lie or tell the truth. And in those studies, by and large, we do a pretty good job at identifying who's telling the truth versus lying. And one of the, there, there are two or three dimensions that are pretty good at predicting. One is people who are telling the truth tend to use I words more, but they also use a group of words that we sometimes call differentiation words or exclusive words. These are words like except, but, without. These are words where a person is making a distinction between what is in a category and what's not in a category. And when people are telling the truth, they will say what they did, but also what they didn't do. What did I do last night? Well, I was going to go to the store, but then I realized I forgot so-and-so, and instead I did this. The person who lies, that is incredibly complicated because they didn't do anything last night, and now they're going to try to tell you what they thought about doing but didn't do. So when a person is lying, it's too complex to use these exclusive kind of words. How effective are we at identifying lying? Uh, in a lab study, lab situation, which is completely artificial, we are able to identify liars at about 66 percent, where 50 percent is chance. That, by the way, is quite good. A, a human who just reads the transcript, it will be they'll identify uh, truth tellers. The different they'll distinguish at about the base rate of 53 percent. And other lab studies where you have a human viewing a, a in, interrogation, they'll their hit rates about 57 percent. 66 percent, not great, but better than chance. We're, one of the things that I've been partic become particularly interested in is using language to start to identify uh, thinking styles. Working with a, uh, a linguist friend of mine, uh, David Beaver, we were interested in what if we looked at admissions essays of students who've been admitted to the University of Texas. So I worked with the admissions office. We were able to get 50,000 admissions essays from 25,000 students who, who enrolled at the university and then tracked how they did once they came to, to college. And I was interested in, can we see markers of thinking style that would predict how they would perform? And what we did in this project was uh, we started playing with language in ways that I had not thought about before. And we started off with a, doing just a simple, uh, essentially a, an SVD or a, a, a factor analysis. And what I discovered was that these eight dimensions of function words formed a beautiful factor. Articles and prepositions are correlated positively about 0.3. These other dimensions, like personal and impersonal pronouns, auxiliary verbs, negations, conjunctions, adverbs, etc., all of those are internally related. They're all positively correlated with each other between 0.2 and 0.3. And all of those are negatively correlated with articles and prepositions. In other words, it is a coherent central dimension of language. And we find this wherever we go, we go searching. And what we can do, and, and I know, first of all, I, I, I have to apologize to real data scientists because you're listening to the way I do these analyses and I know you're just appalled by it. But here's something you can do. You add up articles and pre prepositions, and then you subtract those other ones, and actually it makes a coherent and internally consistent, uh, reliable statistic. And what it is, what comes from this, is what I'm calling, it's a, a dimension that ranges from analytic thinking to more dynamic or narrative thinking. So if you pull out the top scores of this, you'll read an essay that says something like this. 
I have applied to the University of Texas because there are because the psychology department has a very good reputation and there are three things I seek to understand, blah, 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 blah. It, frankly, a pr often pretty boring essay. And then you pull out the bottom essays in terms of these are the ones that are the most narrative, the more, more dynamic. They're using lots of uh, pronouns and auxiliary verbs, et cetera. When I was seven years old, my family moved from Marfa to uh, Houston. And I realized that uh, people were so different and it made me really think that maybe I should become a psychologist, et cetera. Both of them said they want to be the same major. One of them is very organized, structured, hierarchical in thinking. The other person is much more dynamic in storytelling. Well, what's interesting is this analytic dimension predicts four-year grade point average. And the more analytic a person is, the better they do in college. And the correlation is a, a reliable point, too. And what's interesting is we get this effect if we just look at physics majors, fine arts majors, it makes no difference what the major is. You get the same pattern in every major. You get the same thing within, within gender, within race, within any given demographic. This is a, a relationship that you can take to the bank. Now, what's interesting about this, it also correlates with, with uh, uh, SAT, it's correlated with other, other factors as well. But it's a really interesting approach because we're finding this strategy, this, this uh, thinking style, this analytic thinking style, is a really interesting marker of personality or individual difference. The way that a person uses, writes and thinks is consistent from, from one context to another. Now, the, the baselines are different, but someone who's an analytic thinker in their emails tend to be an analytic thinker when they turn in a class paper and in terms of their day-to-day -day conversations. Now, obviously, if you're having an informal conversation, your general rate of analytic thinking is much lower than when turning in a, a, a paper. But the person who's high in this context tends to be high in that context as well. And in fact, we've recently published an article looking at a, 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 a book that had, or a play that was attributed to Shakespeare. Uh, the, the play is called Double Falsehood. I was invited to give a talk to a, a group of English scholars, which was a fascinating experience itself. But what was interesting was these scholars had all been looking at this book, this play, Double Falsehood. It had been, the play, by the way, had been discovered in the 1700s by a, uh, turns out, a Shakespearean scholar. And the question was, did this guy write th this play, or was it really written by Shakespeare? And about half the Shakespeare scholars thought it was by Shakespeare, the other half thought it was by this other guy. But what was interesting was going through and just looking at the analytic dimension, and by the way, we ended up using many other methods in terms of machine learning, et cetera, and the results all came out the same way. But you could look at Shakespeare's plays in terms of analytic thinking, and his, his uh, uh, 30 plays or so, they were all just clustered together. And then you would look at the other suspect uh, who, who had discovered this, and his writings were there was, it was non-overlapping distributions. And there was another suspect as well who was over here, and that person, John Fletcher, was uh, also outside of the Shakespeare distribution. It was just such a beautiful, that visually you could just look at it, and even Daniela would say, oh, we don't need to do any statistics. No, she wouldn't say that. But, but the point was, it gives you a, a very interesting way of thinking about personality. And what I love about this analytic dimension it doesn't fit personality at all. It has all the markings of personality, consistent over time, internally consistent, predicts real world behaviors, but there's no questionnaire that remotely gets at it. So here's a fundamental dimension of human thinking and a questionnaire, there's just not a questionnaire that makes any sense. You know, who would come up with a, a personality? To what degree are you a narrative versus a, a formal thinker? We could come up with it, but no self-respecting psychologist would think of that as a central dimension to personality. Now, language did not evolve um, to tell us about individuals. Language actually evolved to communicate with other people. Can we start looking at this function world, word world to get a sense of how people are connecting with one another? And one of the ways that we've been doing this, we first started looking at this at, in terms of email. Can we look at how people are, connect, are writing to each other on email and get a sense of, among other things, 
relative status. And what we had done uh, years ago, we had done this experiment. We asked, we wrote a little program so, so that people could give us uh, all of their emails to 10 different people and that the emails that they received from each of those 10 different people, and it would uh, sort them so that we, we only had the words that went to each person. And we had the people rate each of the people they were corresponding with, and one of the questions was, Who's the higher status? To what degree are you the higher status of the two versus the same versus the other person's higher status? And we also asked how much you liked them and so forth. Well, it turned out the status variable was the most potent. And what we found was that a group of pronouns predicted relative status quite a bit. It's the relative use of them. The one that came out the, the strongest was I words, but other, other pronouns came out well as, came out high as well. Specifically, in an interaction, the person who's the higher status uses I words less, and the lower status person uses I words more. And, I, and the effect sizes were quite high relative to what I usually find, about a 1.0 in using a Cohen's D. And so I, I looked at this and I thought, God, that's remarkable. I can't believe that would be true for me. And so I analyzed my own data. Sure enough, I was no different from anybody else. And what I discovered was what happens was if an undergraduate student writes me, they say, Dear Dr. Pennebaker, I am so-and-so, and I was wondering if I could talk with you because I have some ideas about so-and-so. And I'd write back to the student, Dear student, thank you so much for your email. How about next Tuesday? That would be great to see you. I look at my email to the dean. Dear dean, I'm Jamie Pennebaker, and I want to talk to you about so-and-so and so-and-so. And the dean writes back, dear Jamie Pennebaker, thank you so much for your email. Uh, I'd look, it, it, uh, come by the office of so-and-so and we'll talk. What's interesting about this is nobody's putting anybody down. This is the language of status in English, that when we are talking to someone of higher status, we tend to use I more. I talk about this in talks and people then get freaked out. And I get emails from people, dear Dr. Pennebaker, Writing you to ask about so and so, and you can see, <laughs> and you know, and at the end, as I P.S., I spent an hour writing this email so I didn't use any I. And they're missing the point. I words are the appropriate thing to say. It, I words are associated with being more personal, more honest, etc., and it's okay. This is the nature of status. And if you look at the emails between the high and low status, both people are being completely appropriate with each other. The high status person is not putting the other person down. This is just the language of status. So I started to get into the world of language more deeply because I became interested in, can I get a sense of, are people connecting with one another? And so we came up with a, a metric that we call language style matching. So we'd look at, I started off with just two people. Look at the degree to which in an interaction, are people using pronouns at comparable rates? Art, articles at comparable weights, uh, prepositions, etc., And it came up with a very simple metric. And again, the psychometrics of it are actually quite, quite beautiful. The more that two people are using pronouns at the same rate, the more likely they're using prepositions at the same rate. And what I found was that in an interaction, the more that two people are clicking, the more they're on the same page when they're talking, the higher their style matching score is. So we tried this with a, uh, some other data sets. Uh, collaborating with a group at Northwestern, we looked at speed dates. And what we, what we did was to analyze, this was a project that had already been done, but these were speed dates where people, where they sat to, in, for their four minute date with somebody, they, it was tape recorded. They all knew it was being tape recorded. And what, so what happens in a speed date, that in the heterosexual speed date, there might be 10, 10 males, 10 females, and each male and each female talk to each other for four minutes. After each talk, they then rate the other person. And then that, that night, they are given a list of the people they met with, and they ask if they'd be interested in going on a date with the other person. And if the two people agree, we call that a match. What we discovered when we did our analysis using this language style matching, we did a better job who, of who would go out on a match or on a date than the people themselves did. Now that sounds just preposterous, I know. 
But the reason it's, it's not is because very often one person would say, yes, that was a great interaction, let's go out on a date. The other person would say, are you kidding? That guy's a jerk, I'm not, gonna be, I'm not interested. But when the two people really clicked, their style matching score was higher, and it served as a better predictor of who got go out on a subsequent date. And I should say that uh, the, the uh, style matching was not much higher than the self-report. A second study was one that, a reanalysis of a project I'd done earlier, and these were among 86 couples that used instant messaging. And to be in our study, the couple had to agree to give us 10 days of their, uh, uh, their IMs. And we also asked these people, hey, you know, how strong is your relationship? How likely do you think you'll be together in six months? So we went through, analyzed it each, looking at their style matching, and what we found was we did a really good job of predicting if the couple would still be together uh, three months later. These were college freshmen, their relationships are really unstable, which from a social scientist perspective is exactly what you want, because you need a little variability here. What we found was that just doing a median split of this style matching, those that were above average, 80% were still together three months later. Those that were below average, only about 52% were still together three months later. And what's so interesting about this is the style matching score was completely unrelated to the, the, the people's self-reported quality of their relationship. And their self-reported quality of a relationship and predictions about how likely they'd be together in the future was not at all correlated if they were, in fact, still together. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that this style matching approach, we've now started to look at small groups. We've looked at this at, uh, in, in, at my university. I teach uh, a very large introductory psychology class that's an online class that allows us to, we have 1,500 people in this online class, and every day we're able to break a, a class into small groups of five, six, seven, eight people, and we're able to analyze the language of these small chat groups. And what we can find is that, that certain features of language predict the quality of the group itself. And now what we've been doing is trying to manipulate the group itself to see if we're able to get a better sense if we're able to change the dynamics. And we're finding that we can change the dynamics by telling the group, you all don't seem to be on the same page. Uh, try to pay more attention to other people. And we do that and it improves their style matching. Doesn't make them more productive, but it does bring up their style matching. But the point is, here's a way we can start to bring about changes. So, I have given you a very quick and dirty overview. Now, I have not talked about research that we've done and others starting to look at larger groups, looking at companies and, and corporations, and, and uh, also starting to look at uh, communities and cultures over time to get a sense of, can we start to identify changes in thinking or mood or whatever? The point is, is we are at the beginning of a new era. And I look at my traditional colleagues in social psychology with a little bit a sense of shock that how many don't get that we are in a new era. That I think the best social psychology is now frankly being done by Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and groups like that. That we now have access to tools that are unbelievable, that are gonna change the whole face of what I think is, is, is uh, all of social science. Now I should tell you, uh, many of the groups like Facebook, Google, man, they don't understand human beings at all. They're great engineers, and they are good at following the data, but they don't have a good sense of the underlying dynamics. And what's beginning to happen now, and this is why I love working with RADA, is we're getting these two groups of people, and we're now at this, at this point where we're able to start talking to each other, taking advantage of generations of really solid social science that's not been informed by giant data that allows us to see things that we never could see before and working together with a group of really smart people who can understand data in ways that we've never been able to or even thought about because we're dealing at it with scale. So it's an honor to be here and I look forward to talking to people afterwards. Thanks very much. I was very interested in your uh, example of being able to predict an undergraduate's uh, performance based on the uh, formal versus narrative writing style in their essay. Um, have you, what about 
uh, PhD students, PhD admissions, and predicting their performance. Has anyone studied that, or have you just personally learned anything in your career that, that helps you predict who makes a good PhD student? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've actually had discussions with the graduate office. Our, our problem at the University of Texas and, and all universities is so few, so few people come to a, a graduate program. And um, the way that admissions, admissions work is it's, all, it's much more mysterious than it is with a big mechanized undergraduate population. Would it predict? I'm going to, I would bet that it would, but much, it would be very weak would be my guess. Because applying to graduate school, almost by definition, the people are fairly successful as undergraduates, and they're probably pretty good analytic thinkers. And I can make a pretty good argument that the people who are going to be successful are also people who are pretty good at making up stories as well. I guess the, the fundamental issue as, as a, as a PhD student, you need creativity more so than at the undergraduate level, and if there are predictors for that. Uh, we've not looked at that, and again, there's this interesting problem of trying to come up with good objective measures of creativity. There, you know, there are some laboratory-based ones, but I think what you're talking about in terms of academic creativity, that's a tough nut to crack. A lot of people have used personality questionnaires to, to get at it but I don't know of any that do. But if you have a data set, I'm, I'm ready to analyze it. Thank you.